Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. ...counselor, and two students, Joseph and Kara. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Joseph, how are you today? Fine, thanks. And Kara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study and how you are managing your time, OK? Yes. I think so. OK, so I'll start with Kara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends and socialising? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So, what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Kara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkeling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way and people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects and picking it up again next year as a minor. You have a lot on your plate and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about 10 hours more than the average student a week. Think about it and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at 11.30. OK, good. Come to my office at 11.45 and wait in reception. OK? OK. I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Joseph, how are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also socialising through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So, you've managed to integrate well? I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up and before you know it, you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late? No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course, during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work, OK? Yes, 
I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend 90% of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. These could also cost you your degree. Is there any particular reason you missed these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before and, well, we went out afterwards and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies and less time on socialising. The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. OK, I'll see you in a month. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecturer discussing the possibility of creating nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. We look at the sun, a huge ball streaming out essentially limitless energy into space, and we think about how we need that energy here on Earth. Our oil reserves are running out, coal burning causes much pollution, and nuclear energy has many dangers. But where does the sun itself get its energy? The answer is that the sun makes it using fusion, or, more specifically, in a hydrogen fusion process. There is no pollution, no radioactivity, no waste products, and we have plenty of hydrogen. So, hydrogen fusion seems the perfect answer to our energy needs, and scientists have long attempted to achieve it here on Earth. So what happens during this process? The first step is to make two light atomic particles approach. In the case of our sun, these are hydrogen particles, the lightest and also the easiest to deal with. However, the problem is that the nuclei of atoms have electric fields and fusion between these particles is opposed by their similar electric charge. They most naturally repel each other and the nuclei of all elements are exactly the same in this respect. Thus, in order to overcome this repulsion and force them together, in the second step, the particles are heated. The trouble is, you need a lot of heat, incredible temperatures of the sort only seen on the surface of the sun. This is many millions of degrees, far higher than the melting point of any known material. Still, the concept is simple. The hot, wildly moving particles, which are now called plasma, will crash into each other, resulting in the third step, the fusion into helium, which releases energy and begins a self-sustained process. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So, we know how fusion works. Thus, the big question is, can we create it here on Earth? We actually have the technology to superheat hydrogen into plasma, but no container on Earth can deal with those temperatures. Thus, we need to confine this superheated material so that it doesn't touch anything. For that, we need a special reactor, and most research has focused on an apparatus known as a tokamak system. That's T-O-K-A-M-A-K, -A -A an acronym from some Russian words meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic field. It's an apt name, since a very powerful magnetic field is used to confine and suspend the super hot plasma in the air so that it doesn't touch anything. This is possible only because this plasma has an electric charge which interacts with the magnetic field. Of course, the walls of the fusion vessel will still get hot, very hot, and to avoid being melted they must be cooled with a cryogenic system to intensely low temperatures. But now we are faced with the second problem. If we are to draw power from this system, the reaction must be continuous and controllable. However, when fusion begins, the plasma becomes unstable, and at these temperatures, that is a very serious situation. If we lose control, a disaster could result. Despite the obstacles, in 2010, a European device managed some success, but needed far more power to generate the fusion reaction than that produced from the fusion itself. Obviously then, it was not useful as a power source. More to the point, this system could only sustain a fusion reaction for a fraction of a second, yet to self-sustain, the fusion needs to run for at least 10 seconds. And the future looks... bleak. Unfortunately, most scientists predict that many decades will have to pass before fusion power can become a practical reality. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student... Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about staying healthy in university. First, you have some time to look at questions 33 to 40. London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about AD 200, the administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferior and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about 20 foot high. Why did they build such high walls? 
It was a protective measure, which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop, Restitutus, who is known to have attended the imperial council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks. Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organise your time around studies and socialising, but you can socialise while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium, with a variety of programmes, such as aerobics and weight training. If the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative or speak with sports administration manager, Mr Lawrence Cavendish. Now, I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial, physically and emotionally. The obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, be happier and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life as women are prone to osteoporosis. It also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle. And the more exercise you do, and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximised and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. 
Now, I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures and another two or more hours studying. That's a long time to be sitting. And that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about sports. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Not all people like to work, but everyone likes to play. As sports help people live happily, they help to keep people healthy and feeling good. When people are playing games, they move a lot. This is good for their health. Having fun with their friends makes them happy. So all over the world, men and women, boys and girls, enjoy sports. Since long ago, adults and children have called their friends together to spend hours, even days, playing games. Sports usually take a variety of forms. Organised competitions, which draw huge crowds to cheer their favourite team to victory. Athletic games played for recreation anywhere sufficient space is found, and hunting and fishing. Most sports are seasonal, so that what is happening in sports depends on the time of the year. As sports change with the season, people often do not play the same games in winter as in summer. If you want to know what others' favourite sports are, first of all, you should find where they live. Generally speaking, people in hot areas are fond of swimming, while people in cold places love skiing or skating. In this case, surfing is believed to be an important sport in Hawaii. The Pacific Ocean sends huge waves up on the beaches, waves that are just right for surfing. Some sports, including wrestling, boxing, horse racing, etc., are called spectator sports, as the number of spectators greatly exceeds the number of players in the game. Other sports are called participant sports, drawing a crowd of onlookers only on special occasions, such as tournaments. Some sports are commercial and professional, with players who are paid for their participation and with audiences who pay admission to watch. 